stuff. We got Mr. Andrew. Where you at, Andrew? Let's see it. Let's see it. Uh, there he is. Hey, up, yeah, thanks to me, Joe. So excited to be here. How you doing, man? Uh, great, great. So, I sent out an email before this uh, all started, right? And I said, if you reply to this email and you let me know what your talk, your favorite talk that you're looking forward to is, uh, I'll send you out some swag. And quite a few people said they were excited about your talk because Serge is absolutely killing it right now. And we need to let everyone know that. And you, so you, you've come on here to talk to us about the very hot topic of what I can never pronounce, the RLHF, uh, if I put those letters correctly in order. And uh, it's, it's hot right now, man. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool stretch I jump into it now. Or yeah, and I am gonna share your screen so that it is here, and I'll come back in ten minutes. We're switching over to lightning talks now, so this is gonna be a ten-minute talk. You got ten minutes on the clock, man. I'll see you soon. Uh, thanks, Demetrius. Uh, cool. Yeah. So my name is uh, Andrew. Uh, I'm from uh, Surge AI, where I'm leading the engineering team. Uh, just to introduce ourselves a little bit. We are a, a full stack uh, human feedback company uh, that started around three years ago. So we cover everything from hiring our own contractors uh, to building our own uh, labeling platform for them to uh, annotate on uh, and, and delivering data to clients. And recently we've been spending a lot of time on LMs and, and RLHF. Uh, so to give some more context about our work, uh, we've been partnering with uh, other groups like Anthropic, uh, OpenAI, uh, Google, Cohere, and others to kind of help provide data to provide to power like a lot of these uh, top of the line systems and and make them kind of safe and and useful. So this this slide kind of has um, a bunch of the research papers that that have used our work and uh, it's is available on our website, which is searchhq.ai. So today I'm going to go through the, the process of RLHF, but kind of from the perspective of data collection. Uh, so first I'll talk about the, the supervised fine tuning piece of it, uh, and then the, the ranking piece of it, and kind of give some of the lessons we've learned along the way uh, doing this type of work. Uh, so before we jump into the details, uh, I'll kind of motivate the problem. So let's say you're just fresh off training your, your new LLM, you fired up and maybe you're hope to, hoping to see how well it does compared to ChatGPT, and you ask it to write a story um, about Harry Potter using AI to fight Voldemort. So the problem here is the base LLM, as we all know, is only trained to predict the next word on internet text. So when I ask it to generate a story uh, before any RLHF, it's actually not going to generate the story. It's just going to kind of continue on uh, from there. So it actually just kind of keeps writing instructions about the story instead of actually writing the story. Once we're able to successfully uh, you know, run the RLHF, uh, we'll get the actual content we want. So here's uh, an example from GPT-4. So it has RLHF for similar training. When we ask it to write the story, uh, it actually you know, starts doing what we want. So how do we actually get this useful behavior? How do we go from like this next word predictor to the kind of like the useful assistant uh, character that we're all familiar with in, in ChatGPT? So there's there's kind of two stages to the to the process, uh, as most typically as the way it's most commonly done right now. So the first is a supervised fine tuning. So this involves just collecting a um, a few thousand to tens of thousands of prompt completion pairs. So an example of a prompt completion pair uh, could be the story I, I just showed, um, or here's another example from a surge labeler. So we were basically just collecting a bunch of prompts and then writing from scratch the desired output from our, from our model and directly um, fine tuning the model with that. So this is kind of like laying the uh, foundation uh, for the assistant we want. So all the kind of behaviors we want from our assistant 
should be included as part of this fine tuning data set. So, you know, in this example, the model just gives the tweet directly when we ask it to write a, write a tweet about the matcha flavored sparkling water. But you could imagine another type of assistant that's more verbose that says, hey, sure, I'm happy to do that for you. Like, here's the tweet. Um, you could also imagine that if this was about like medical advice or financial advice, you could want to give a disclaimer. So any kind of behaviors we want in the assistant, we're going to want to put into this fine tuning data set just to kind of lay the foundation for telling the model like what it can do and the possible outputs. So here's kind of like one, you know, one thing that can happen if you don't do that well. So this is a llama model that has had uh, instruction tuning, but it, it never was actually told. It, it never actually had any data in its fine tuning data set that, that let it know that it could say, I don't know. So I ask it for um, the address of my favorite Italian restaurant in San Francisco. All of the fine tuning data the model received, it always involves the model being asked a question and the model being answering that question, not saying, I don't know. So instead of saying, I don't know, because this is like a very specific restaurant, it actually just makes up basically a completely random, random address. So I think one lesson learned from the, the supervised fine tuning spot is that this is where we really like lay the foundation, all the behaviors we want the model to have, we want to include them in here. Uh, the next part um, is, is reward modeling. So this involves uh, basically kind of the next step where instead of just feeding the model prompts and completions, we're, we're kind of uh, nudging it towards being a more and more helpful assistant uh, over, over time. So we kind of sample uh, different outputs from the model and then we have labelers rank them indicating which is better. And we kind of use that, those rankings to kind of run the reinforcement learning process and, and kind of gradually increase the model, like through different iterations of training, gradually increase its capability and its helpfulness as an assistant. Uh, so I think one of the interesting things here is it, it can be really hard uh, to do the rankings because when you're looking at a model output, there's a ton of uh, model output, there's tons of different factors that go into it. So you can imagine an example where um, Maybe we're asking for information about someone and one of the completions is a beautiful answer. Uh, it's like perfectly written. It's great. It's the perfect length. However, it has like one or two small like facts wrong hallucinations. And then we can imagine comparing that to another answer where all the facts are right, but the writing's a little sloppy, you know, it's not, it's not the best. Uh, besides that. So how do we actually weigh the, all the different things that go into like what makes the completion good, like the factuality, the writing quality, the length. So it can be really hard to, to manage that. And this is where we found it's really important to kind of be very clear uh, in your instructions to people about what you're prioritizing and what your desired behavior is. So another another uh, problem we've, we noticed here is um, sometimes you might sample a bunch of completions and maybe kind of all of them are bad and you don't want to reward any of them. So this is a, an example from this from the same model. Um, so let's say we're chatting with it and we ask it about the most recent um, John, John Wick movie. Um, there's two answers here and they're, and they're both kind of wrong because they both say John Wick 3, um, even though John Wick 4 has come out in the meantime. So the ideal situation here is we we want the model to basically acknowledge the that its training data is not most up to date. Um, however, if we if we pick one of these, we'll basically be rewarding it, you know, either way for for giving the wrong answer. So another thing we've kind of built into our RLHF uh, pipelines uh, that's originally uh, an idea from the Anthropic RLHF paper is the idea of editing. So we actually have uh, a a function in our labeling software where if you actually don't like any of the options, uh, you can press an edit button. And in this case, you can imagine the person uh, editing the first the first answer and then actually rewriting it uh, to have the proper response. And then instead of comparing the original two um, completions, we can actually compare the the edited response, the the one in the bottom left hand here, with with the one that uh, is kind of like the source response. So instead of uh, telling it to prepare, to, 
to prefer one of these uh, bad completions over the other bad completion, we're telling it to prefer the good completion over um, over one of the bad ones. Uh, so yeah, I'll mention uh, briefly like a final kind of uh, future research direction I'm excited about in, in RLHF. So I kind of mentioned the problem of like all these different things we're having to complete. So there's actually some recent work from the Allen Institute where they have the labelers uh, explicitly label, explicitly mark in the text uh, when there's an error in factuality uh, and you know when when things are irrelevant. And by actually uh, specifically indicating these problems, we kind of have a gr more granular data that we can combine in different ways to create a reward signal. So you could kind of decide after the fact uh, how much you wanted to penalize uh, an error in factfulness. Uh, and, and now you want to weigh that against other other things in the reward model. Um, looks like um, I'm out of time now, but yeah, I'm happy to to answer any questions, and uh, I'll be around in the in the chat later. Excellent, thank you so much for this. This is awesome. So I am going to keep us cruising. For anyone that has questions for Andrew, feel free to throw them in the chat and learn a little bit more about this RLHF. <laughs> I have to think really hard every time I say that, which is not the best sign. But dude, Andrew, thank you so much, man. Thank you. And it's really cool to see everything that you all are doing at Surge. I know uh, I said it before, but I'm a huge fan. And I think that, uh, you know, what you're doing, it's no small feat. Yeah, thanks, Demetrius. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, dude. Well, I'll keep it cruising. I'm kicking you off now. <laughs>